Now we're going to look at part two of the reading, starting now, the readings of uh, for this uh, first Sunday in Lent. The theme is sin. Understanding sin, which is impossible. When we sin and we look back and say, why did I ever do that? It's amazing. There's no reason. Sin is inscrutable because it's a negation. But this first text, you see, is from Genesis 2. And um, it's an etiological text. The point is, how come in this world there's suffering and death, loneliness, anger, hunger? Whatever happened? Newman has a wonderful um, paragraph where he says, if I were to meet a young man who obviously came from a good family, had a good education and so forth, and I see him in such a mess, I would conclude to what in typical Newman language, uh, I would conclude to an aboriginal calamity. So that's how I know that there's original sin. I look at human nature, its, its desires, the way that people respond to nobility, and then the mess we're in. And I conclude to an aboriginal calamity. That's almost the way that the wise men of Israel did it. You see, in the wisdom tradition, there was this understanding. For instance, uh, Israel is beloved of God. Then how come they're in exile and suffering and, you know, because it was an aboriginal calamity at the very moment that God was giving Israel the law by which it could have an identity and lead its life, they were down at the bottom of the mountain making a golden calf. Idolatry. Idolatry is the root. So you say that's why Israel, chosen by God, still suffers. Because at the root, the original calamity, if you will, is right there. The wise men of Israel saw that. David, the same thing. David, the beloved. How come then there is such war? You know, Absalom getting killed, all the rest. How come? Because at the root of David's king, you know, uh, reign, there was murder uh, and adultery. Or Uriah, the Hittite. David saw Bathsheba, desired her lustfully, took her, and uh, when Uriah, he called her Uriah home, tried to get him to go sleep with his wife, he couldn't do it. Now, whether Uriah suspected something, or whether just as a good noble soldier, he wasn't going to have amenities that everybody else didn't have, he stayed in the barracks. This narration, which is so powerful, uh, nobody tells us. We don't know why. But anyway, uh, to cover up, finally, to cover up his adultery, David commits murder. He tells, uh, Joe, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the general of his army, where the fighting is the thickest, put Uriah and then draw back and let him get killed. Uh, so adultery and murder... They're at the root. Does that mean God turned his back on David? No. The very child that succeeded him on the throne was a child of Bathsheba. Not the one she conceived in adultery. That child died. But another child is Solomon. So you see this notion of original sin, aboriginal calamity, is, is, is a theological conclusion inspired by the Holy Spirit, looking at the human race. That's the one that Newman saw. The promise, the beauty, the nobility of which we're capable, and the sin, and the mess. Because at the beginning, there was an aboriginal calamity. And that's what uh, this text is going to tell us now, you see. And uh, Adonai Elohim, 
uh, formed Adam. Adam. Adam means man. Sometimes Adam means the man. Sometimes it's a name, but it means humanity. It's hard to restrict it. That's the power and the difficulty of Hebrew. Okay. So he formed Adam, dust from the Adama. He's Adam and he's formed from the Adama, from the soil. Huh? And he breathed into his nostrils the Nishmat Chayim, the breath of life. And Ha'adam became a living soul, a soul alive. Huh? Now this is beautiful. We're in Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, we have rather the whole notion that man, Adam, that man, Adam, is male and female. He made them. Let us make Adam, male and female, he made them. So Adam is male and female. He's, he's humanity as well as being Adam and Eve. Um, and so... Uh, God formed him and made him in his image, sharing a bit of God, representing God. You know, a king's statue is an image of the king, and it asserts his authority over that part of his empire. Man asserts God's authority over the universe. See what we've done? But you see, so Adam is that figure, that person, you see? And uh, he becomes a soul alive. Now, if you look at the text carefully in Genesis, other things are souls alive, napshot hayot or whatever. Uh, but they're not made so the way that Adam is made that way. The first text talks about Adam being the image of God. This text talks about him having something of the breath of God in him. You see? And he breathed into his nostrils, the nishmat chayim, the, the breath of life. But the breath of life that we share, unlike any of the animals, who in this text don't even exist yet, because we breathe like God. We have God's life, his breath in us. Both texts are trying to talk about the incalculable dignity of humankind which makes the way we live and what we do to each other all the more tragic, you see? Uh, and then, Yahweh Elohim, Adonai Elohim, took him and put him in the Garden of Eden, which is to the east, and he placed there Adam, whom he had formed. This is like the Exodus, right? He took them out of Egypt and brought them into his own promised land. He took him and put him in the garden. A garden. You see, that's beautiful. That's how kind God is, and this is what he wanted to do for Adam. You see, and there was there in the garden everything good to eat and good to look at, and the tree of the, of the knowledge, or first the tree of life in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, this is all symbolic. You know, we are talking about this aboriginal calamity, both because it's evil and because of the way it's, it's so huge. The authors, enlightened men, mystics, speak symbolically. They have to. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what? It means you do what you want and you say whether it's evil. I remember somebody came back from Caracas and said, middle-class women down there, this is years ago, uh, all they talk about is abortion. And just as he said it, I said this text, you will know good and evil. You want to do what you want to do, and you say whether it's good or evil, which is the whole abortion debate. And so, uh, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, notice this analysis of sin. We've moved into chapter 3 now. And the serpent was the most arum, cunning, crafty, uh, of all the beasts of the field which 
the Lord God had made. This doesn't escape the Lord God. This uh, ser serpent, the Nachash, is made by God. He's under God's authority. But he's a rebel. He's Satan. And God leaves him there. You see? And he said to the woman, Haisha, Af, Af in Hebrew, bah, so, like that impudent. You see? Uh, God said no. He never uses the word Yahweh because that's a covenant word and there's no covenant between this serpent, Satan, and God. So God said, you shall not eat uh, from any of the trees in the garden. The woman should have known right away that this was a liar. Instead, she gets into a theological discussion with him, which is so dumb. And this is what we do. This is an analysis of sin. Okay. Um, uh, and so the woman said to the serpent, why is she talking to the serpent? From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden uh, we cannot eat. Uh, and uh, if we do, uh, you know, uh, we might have difficulties. Uh, and the serpent responds, okay? Uh, see, you shall not eat of it or even touch it. And then she says, lest you die. God didn't say lest. He said you'll die. You see the way we are with sin? We palliate it. I want to do something. I've got to find out a way to make it good. I want. I know good and evil. And so... See, this is an analysis of sin, the most masterful in the whole of world literature. But the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. Contradicting God and knowing he's doing it. He wants to get them and get them under his power. They're the image of God. And he wants to get at God through the image of God, which is what he's still doing. He can't hurt God. But he can ruin us. Okay? You certainly will not die. And then listen. No, God knows well. At the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God's, knowing good and evil. And so, she saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom. So there you have it, right? The concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eye, and the pride of life. If I get a hold of this, I'll have wisdom. I can do what I want, and I can say whether it's good or evil. This is what we always want to do. So she took some of his fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband, who was at her side, and he ate it. Now Satan said, your eyes will be open. The text, then the eyes of both were opened and they saw wisdom no they saw that they were naked now earlier in the part that the, the, our reading for the Sunday skips uh, it said uh, you see that they were both naked and they felt no shame there was nothing embarrassing about sex you see now their eyes are open so they know good and evil no they see they're naked so they sewed fig leaves and made loincloths for themselves. That is a meditation on sin. If we took it to heart, we wouldn't sin so much.